chapter 16 of Revelation and verse number 15. Are we there? The Bible says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. So based on that verse, talk to me. Who is the blessing for? Those who watch and those who keep their garments. I see urgency in verse 15. Do you see urgency here? Okay, what do you see here? What is one primary reason why we must watch and why we must keep our garments? What is one of those primary reasons? All right, so we won't walk naked. What else? What's the first sentence there? That Jesus comes as a thief. So we must be found watching. We must be found having on and keeping on the garment. Is that clear, my friends? And in order for us to comprehend this verse fully, we must compare Scripture with Scripture. To better understand this blessing in chapter 16, verse 15 of the Revelation, we must first look at where John, who wrote the book of Revelation, where he first mentioned similar words as in chapter 16 and verse number 15. And the scripture where John mentions similar words. Go back to verse 15. Behold, I come as a what? Thief. I want to make sure you're with me. Blessed is he that watcheth, underscore that word watcheth, and keepeth his garments, underscore that. Now go with me in your Bibles to chapter 3 of the Revelation. Where are we going to? Chapter 3 of the Revelation. This is where John first used all those words together. Look with me. Chapter 3 of the Revelation. So the message to Sardis is applicable, is connected to the third blessing in Revelation chapter 16 and verse number 15. Look at verse 2 with me of chapter 3. Are we there? The Bible says, be what? That's your word. One of your three words. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not what? Watch. I will come on thee as what? As a thief. And thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Do you see two of those three words? Do you see them? So which word have we not yet read? The garment. Wonderful. Skip on down to verse 4 now. We read about Christ saying we must watch. He comes as a thief. Are we studying God's word? Skip on down to verse 4. It says, Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. So hold your place in chapter 3 of the Revelation. Go back with me to chapter 16 of the Revelation. Let's focus on this third blessing. Verse number 15. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. Verse number 15. The first sentence is, Behold, I come as a thief. What does it mean when the Bible says that Christ will come as a thief? Talk to me. Unexpectedly, what else? Could this mean the second coming? Will the second coming be as a thief? <laughs> Friends, primarily, that phrase, Behold, I come as a thief, it's not talking about the second coming of Christ. How does a literal thief enter a home? Blowing a trumpet? Making noise? He, si he works silently, right? Will the second coming of Christ be silent? A thief comes in secret. Will there be a secret coming of Christ? No. So friends, what does this mean? Yes, it's linked to the second coming, but primarily, behold, I come as a thief. It doesn't point to the second coming of Christ primarily. 
It really means that Jesus is going to come to our names in the investigative judgment. And not only will he examine our characters, but he will declare a verdict upon our cases. This is what it means primarily, that Jesus comes as a thief. Don't take my words for it. Go back with me, chapter 3. Chapter 3 of the Revelation, and look with me again at verse number 3. Remember, therefore, how thou hast heard and received, and hold fast and repent, if therefore thou shalt not watch. I want everybody open Bibles. Amen. Thou shalt not watch. I will come unto thee as a what? Thief. And thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. And verse number 4. Keep your garment. Verse 5 now together, what it says. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. So connected to Christ coming as a thief. He says, I will not blot out the names of my people who confess and repent of their sins. Does that make sense to you, friends? So now, for Christ not to blot out our names from the book of life, must we first be examined and investigated? Do you see it now? Christ coming as a thief. It's talking about Christ in investigating our characters and also declaring a verdict upon our cases. If that's clear, my friends, say amen. And notice now, what would that verdict be? The Bible tells us in chapter 22 of the Revelation, verse number 11 and verse number 12, Jesus says, Behold, I come quickly. But in verse 11 it says, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. That's the verdict. The one who is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is a holy, let him be holy still. That's the verdict. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give unto every man, according as his work shall be. Jesus says, I come as a thief. Understand this. There's never a time. When Jesus is not examining our characters, our thoughts, our words, our actions are constantly being examined by Jesus Christ. But the second phrase is, it's Christ declaring a verdict upon our cases. Now, we may know the time period when Christ will begin to, ex to, 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 to denounce and to proclaim verdicts upon cases. But none of us know when Christ will actually call my name or call your name with the announcement of that verdict. We do not know what day, what hour, what minute, what second. In that context, he comes to us as a thief. When he calls our name in the judgment and declares a verdict, if you're filthy, remain filthy still. There's no change. No more opportunities. If you are righteous and holy, be righteous and holy still. There's no more opportunities to go back into sin. You are sealed by God. Or you are seared for damnation. What will my verdict be? What will your verdict be? Is this a serious matter? Christ coming as a thief? Go back to chapter 3 with me. Look at verse number 4. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in what? White raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but confess his name to my father. Let's pause right there. So whose names will Christ not blot out of the book of life and save them? Whose names? Those who overcome, overcome what? 
sin. So must we overcome sin? So what is the implication here? Will some people's names be blotted out of the book of life and they are going to be lost? Is that the implication here? So Jesus coming as a thief, it means investigation and declaration of our characters, whether we are sealed for heaven or seared for damnation. Some are going to be accepted and others are going to be what? Rejected. Which group are you going to be in? And the decisions I am making today and what you are making today will cause all of us to be in one of those two groups. Being accepted, names remaining in the book of life or being rejected and names being blotted out of the book of life. Look at this. Great Controversy, page 400. And 8 to 3 says, as the books of record, let's read, are open in the judgment, the lives of all who have believed on Jesus come in review before God. Beginning with those who first lived upon the earth, our advocate presents the cases of each successive generation and closes with the living. Let's read. Every name is mentioned. Every case closely investigated. Names are accepted. Names are Rejected. When any have sins remaining upon the books of record, unrepented of and unforgiven, their names will be what? Blotted out of the book of life, and the record of their good deeds will be erased from the book of God's remembrance. Go back with me. So, is this message present truth? Behold, I come as. A thief. And come on, talk to me. And what does it mean when Christ says, I come as a thief? Primarily. It is connected to investigative judgment. Is there ever a time when we are not being examined by Christ? Say so it's more to it. What is the second half? Behold, I come as a thief. He's going to declare what? A verdict upon our cases. Look at this. GC 490. Solemn are the scenes connected with the closing work of the atonement. Momentous are the interests involved therein. The judgment is now passing in the sanctuary above. For many years, this work has been in progress. Soon. None know how soon. The judgment will pass to the cases of the living. What judgment, talk to me, will pass to the cases of the living? What judgment? Is there ever a time when we are not being investigated? Are the angels now taking record of our thoughts, words, and actions? So what judgment will pass to the living? The declaration in a literal earthly court. Is there a phase where arguments are heard? And then is there, a, is there a judgment phase? And then comes the sentencing phase. So what phase are we now in today? The investigation phase. The arguments. The reports are being written. What is the next phase? The verdict, my friends. So when will the verdict be passed upon the living? Hear me now. There is a time period for it. But what we don't know is when my name is going to be called. I'm going to show you what that time period is. But you do not know exactly when your name is going to be called. And when my name is called, when your name is called, we have to make sure that Jesus can say, he or she is righteous, is holy, then be righteous. Be holy still. What if Christ calls my name that moment and he says, uh, I am unjust, I'm filthy. Will there be a second opportunity? In an earthly court, can people appeal a sentence? But when Jesus declares that verdict, <laughs> oh friends, it's final. It's done. Behold, I come as a... Thief, 
Is that clear, my friends? Now, it is solemn. When, let me ask you a question. Is there anything that ever happened in your life? Has there ever been an incident in your life? Something terrible happened and you tried, you wondered, could I retrace the hand of time so that this terrible act don't happen? You all shook your head. Give me an example. What terrible thing ever happened to you and you wish you could retrace time and make a different decision? Talk to me. You see, you're mumbling. Talk to me. Huh? Uh, all right. What about a car accident? Someone hit you. I've been in one. Or you hit somebody. You say, oh, my Lord, have mercy. I thought, I wish I could just return and retrace the hand of time. Couldn't happen. Why? It happened. So when Christ declares that verdict, can we retrace that verdict? It says, soon, no, no, how soon? It will pass to the cases of the living. In the awful presence of God, our lives are to come up in review. At this time, above all others, it behooves how many? Every soul to heed the Savior's admonition. What is it? Watch and pray, for you know not when the time is. What time? Chapter 3, verse 3. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come unto thee as a what? As a thief. Go with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 12. Where are we going to, friends? Luke chapter 12. Talk to me. What may happen if a literal thief breaks into someone's home while the family members are there? What might happen? Talk to me. You're not talking to me? You're mumbling? Talk to me. Let me hear you. I know you're way back there. Let me hear you. Come on, talk to me. All right. May my lives be destroyed. Yes. Property. Yes. So now Christ uses this as a type, a symbol, an example of him coming as a thief. Look with me at Luke chapter 12. Are we there, my friends? Luke chapter 12 and verse number 39. It says, and this know. That if the good man, underscore good man, if the good man of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would not have watched. He would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Be you therefore ready also. Why? For the Son of Man cometh at an hour when you think not. So now, what must a good man know to be prepared for the coming thief? What must he know? You, let me hear you. What must he know? The good man of the house must know the hour when the thief is coming. Why? So he can prepare for the thief. This tells me something. Because Christ now says, even so... Will I come as a thief? In other words, I, you, all of us must also know the time period when Jesus comes as a thief. You're not hearing me. You saw it? We must also know the hour when Christ comes as a thief. When he comes to pronounce verdicts upon our cases, the time period. Even though we do not know the exact date, if we know the time period, all we have to do is just be prepared. If that's clear, my friend, say amen. Go back to verse 39. Notice, I was smiling when I saw this. Verse 39 does not say, if the evil man of the house had known what hour the thief would come. Doesn't say that. The good man. So who does the good man represent? God's faithful people. If that's clear, say amen. It says good men of the house. What is the house a symbol of? The church. So what must the church know to be prepared for Christ coming as a thief? They must know the hour when Jesus comes as a thief. Not his second coming primarily, but primarily when Christ comes now and he calls my name. 
Andrew Henriquez. He calls your name specifically. And then he declares a verdict on my, on your case. We must know the time period of this. Do you want to see it now, friends? So what signs, events has Christ given to us to know when he is about to come as a thief? What are these signs? Friends, it's the signs that point to the enforcing of the Sunday law crisis. Don't take my words for it. Let's prove that. Go back with me. Chapter 16 of the Revelation. Where are we going to, friends? Chapter 16 of the Revelation is the Sunday law crisis. So, friends, when the Sunday law is enforced, at that very time, Jesus comes as a thief. Because our decision, when the Sunday law is enforced, our decision will then cause Jesus now to declare a verdict on our cases. So since we know the time period, we don't know if it's going to be on a Sunday he calls my name, or on Monday he calls your name, or on Monday evening he calls your husband's name. Does it make sense to you? But we know the time period when he comes as a thief. Friends, if the time is drawing near, then we must be watching. Oh, friend, is it making sense to you? We must be keeping our garments. Let's read that. Chapter 16 of the Revelation. What, what two verses precede verse 15? Verse 13? Verse 14. Let's take a look. Verse 13 says, And I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Verse 14, For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto where? The kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day. Of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. So, what's the context, friends? What events, as we see them, we know Jesus is about to come as a thief to call my name, your name, in this investigative judgment and declare you're filthy, be filthy still, or you're righteous. Be righteous still. What is that event in verse 13, verse 14? Now, it doesn't say Mark of the Beast there. It doesn't say Sunday Law there. It simply says uh, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, and what is coming out of their mouths. Frogs, unclean spirits like uh, frogs. Do you have your note paper? Friends, there must be far more teaching in these last days. Are you ready for the notes? The dragon is a symbol of Satan. Amen? We know that. Secondarily, the dragon... Okay, let me ask you, because we have covered this before. What does the dragon... Who does the dragon represent in the secondary sense? The world nations, put it there. The nations of the earth who will rebel against God. How can we confirm that? Write down Ezekiel chapter 29. Verse 2 and verse 3, Ezekiel 29, 2 and verse 3. Right quickly, friends. The second scripture is Revelation chapter 12, verse 4 and verse 5. And write down Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 through verse number 17. The dragon represents the nations that will rebel against God. Who does the beast represent? Talk to me. But which kingdom is the beast? The beast represents the papacy, my sister. The papacy, popery, Roman Catholicism. Write down chapter 13 of the Revelation. Verse 1 through verse number 10. All right. We have one more symbol. What is it? The false prophet. Who does the false prophet represent? Apostate Protestants. Primarily, we're in the United States of America. And what texts say that? Write them down now. Chapter 19 of the Revelation, verse number 20. 
and chapter 13 of the Revelation. Verse 11 to verse number 17. This is the false prophet and what is coming out of their mouth. Frogs, unclean spirits like frogs, to go against God. In other words, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, they are not only united, but they all speak the same thing. Does that make sense to you, my friends? How does a nation speak? Through her laws. So the dragon, the nations, the beast, the papacy, false prophet, apostate, protestant America, they will all unite to go against God to enforce a false day of worship. Don't say amen yet. I haven't proved the false day of worship yet. What comes out of their mouths? Unclean spirits like frogs. Where's the first place we find frogs in the Bible? You see, friends, when the Seventh-day Adventist movement began, most of its members understood these prophecies. But we have come to a time when God's church today know nothing about Bible prophecy. Because the pastors in the pulpits, they tickle your fancy and put you to sleep. And to keep you coming to church, they give you a drug, a good fix, every Sabbath with the music. The heavy bass drums in your ears. Don't get me started, amen? All right. So where do we find frogs in the Bible in the first place? In the book of Exodus chapter 8. Who wrought the miracles of the frogs as a plague upon Egypt? Moses and Aaron. Listen now. But who counterfeited the frogs? Pharaoh's magicians. Question now. What was the issue at that time? What was the issue at that time? What was the issue over? Worship. Because Moses said, Pharaoh, let my people, let God's people go, that we might go and worship him. And by this sign, the frogs, the miracle, God is the God of heaven. But Pharaoh said, no, you will not go and worship God. We also can work miracles, magicians, work some miracles, with sorcery, they brought up these frogs to deceive the people to remain in Egypt in false worship. So now, what comes out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet? Frogs. And what was the issue in the book of Exodus? Worship. So it's a false day of worship coming. Now you can say amen, my friends. And the Bible says in verse number 15, when you see this, behold, I come as a Wow. And what does it mean that Christ comes as a thief? When I'm finished today, you're going to get this, friends. <laughs> what does it mean he comes as a thief? He calls our names individually in the judgment and declare a verdict on our case. And what signs show us he comes as a thief? When the dragon, the nations, the beast, Pope, and America are now what? Uniting to enforce a Sunday law. Jesus is about to call our names. And declare a verdict upon our cases. Am I ready? Are you ready, friends? Have you ever been somewhere very, very important and they gave you a number and you just watch that thing, that number's um, machine ticking away, waiting for your number, right? And when you see two or one before your number, do you begin to fix yourself up? You get your papers together, friends, right? Amen. So in the spiritual sense, when we see a Sunday law nearing, what is God saying to us? Amen. Fix yourself up, friends. It's time to watch. It's time to keep your garments. But friends, you can keep what you don't have. So my question is, dear God, do I have on the garment? What's your question for God right now? Lord, do I have on the garment? It's a Sunday law near. Look at this. This is April 29th, 2016, showing us a Sunday law is near. I'm sorry for those who don't like to hear this. It's the truth, friends. It says uh, Biden, Joe Biden, and Pope Francis team up team up 
Is it a, a sign of the last days? It says Pope Francis has called for an increase in funding for research to find cures to rare diseases, saying there is a need for an increased sensitivity toward those suffering from those illnesses. Let's read. While also calling for what? Universal access to treatment. Every issue plaguing the world. The Pope makes sure he connects to it, his own agenda. What is he calling for? Universal health care. Listen here. And what said Joe Biden thereafter? The same Joe Biden said. He said he calls for an international commitment. Both men are calling for what? A universal health care system. Who was present here? Look at this. It says uh, the event gathered together home friends, scientists, who else? Physicians, who else? Patients, who else? Religious leaders, who else? Philanthropists and government officials. And what grabbed my attention is this. Every global crisis that is affecting the world, the Pope is calling for a uniting of nations and religions. And what does history teach us? That when church and state unite, what happens to God's commandment keeping people? Persecution. The Pope says, if we want to combat terrorists, and terrorism, we need a universal army. Look at this. Pope Francis urges what? The world to unite to fight against ISIS. Then he says, if we want to combat poverty, if we want to combat the financial global crisis, then we need a global financial economy. Everything has to be universal. He says this, watch. He says, Pope Francis, claims what, friends? Global economy, the global economy is close to collapse. How does he know that? Is he planning it? Then he says, the Pope calls for what? A new economic order. Pope Francis on Thursday urged the downtrodden to change the world economic order. The Pope said, listen, if we want to combat immorality, if we want to preserve the family, he says we need a universal Sunday law. Wait a minute. Universal health care? A global army? A, glo a universal Sunday law? You can't see what's going on, friends? Listen to what he says. He says, moments of rest, especially on what day? Sunday are sacred because in them we find God. Then he says, may we always recognize the family as the privileged place to understand, guide and sustain the gifts which arise from our celebrations, especially when? The Sunday Eucharist. Wait a minute. Is he only talking to Catholics? He says, AP News, the Pope says what? No work on Sundays is good. Not only for Catholics, but for the whole world. And then he says, if we want to combat global warming and climate change, what do we need? Universal Sunday law, my friends. How close are we? I want to ask you a question. Will he get his way? Yes. Is he popular? Yes. Look at this. This is April 21st, 2016. It says here, Time Magazine came out with what? It's annual Time 100 list of the most influential people. And no surprise, Pope Francis made the cut. Pope Francis electrified the world because he embodies the basic tenets of Catholic social doctrine, let's read, that also cut across one. All great faiths. Who said that? Joe Biden, VP. So why are they calling for a universal health care system? 
It sounds good to you? Must we unite with them? We are told, look at this. We are told, my friends, here, GC 587, here, the temperance work, the health work. One of the most prominent and important of moral reforms is often combined with the Sunday movement. And the advocates of the Sunday movement represent themselves as laboring to promote the highest interests of society. And those who refuse to unite with them are denounced as the enemies of what? Temperance and reform. The leaders of the Sunday movement may advocate reforms which the people need. Principles which are in harmony with the Bible. Yet while there is but these, a requirement which is contrary to God's law, what can we not do? So God's servants cannot unite with them. A few days ago, I shared this with you. April 11, 2016, it says, this is Madeleine Albright. Who was she? What post she held in America? Former Secretary of State, and what did she say? In order to combat global crisis, she says, religion must be connected with, with policies, civil policies. Now, who is the present Secretary of State? John Kerry. What did he say recently? Look at this. Christian Post, April 27, 2016. John Kerry says what? Religion is what? Vital for foreign policy. Church and state they are calling for. Look at this, friends. It says on Crux, covering all things Catholic, April 27th, it says, Kerry, John Kerry, explains why religion can play a what? A role in U.S. foreign policy. What are they calling for? A union of church and uh, state. And John Kerry, how many of you remember when he was running for the presidency with George Bush on the Republican side? And they asked him, we hear, we heard, John Kerry, you belong to a secret society. The skull and bones. The skull and bones, it's a branch of the Jesuits. What is he calling for? A union of church and state with church. With church. Look at this, friends. This is Huffington Post. April 21st, it says headline, A return to Sabbath keeping. And they're saying we need a Sunday law in America and around the world to care for the environment. I can't believe my eyes. We are here, my friends. It says uh, Sunday, the Lord's Day. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. What day are they calling God Sabbath? Sunday. Do this uh, to return to Eden. Look at this. It's, watch carefully, resurrecting. An old earth day, April 21st, 2016. Listen carefully. What if we, as a what? What if we, as a nation, decided to take a day off from all this energy consumption and disposable waste? What day are they talking about must be implemented in the land? Watch. One day in seven. Hmm? How about the Christian Sabbath, Sunday, to care for the earth? Who is championing Earth Day and let's combat climate change? The Pope of Rome, not only is the Pope calling for this, people are saying the nation must enact a Sunday law, my friends. Jesus says, when you see this, I come as a what? My friends. Even now, I have these uh, bumps on my skin. Chills. It's a reality, my friend. Look at this. Watch this, friends. Catholic Relief Services, Earth Day, and the Sabbath commandment. What, what, what Sabbath are they talking about? Sunday. So what is Earth Day connected to? Sunday observance by law. Look and listen to the Pope now. Pope Francis on what day? 
he says uh, to combat climate change and to preserve the earth, we must discard all religions. Let's all unite. He says, look, these are things that come to my mind. How to do this? Simply in the awareness that we all have something in common. We are all human. And in this humanity, we can get close to each other to work together. But I belong to this religion or to that one. It doesn't matter. Let's all go forward to work together, respecting each other, respecting, he said. What is he saying, friend? It doesn't matter about what religion you're with. Let's put that aside. Let's all unite. Wake up, friend. Inspiration says, uh, volume 5, page 452. Listen carefully. It says, uh, the, let's read right here. The Sunday movement is now making its way in darkness, friends. It says, the leaders are concealing the true issue. And many who unite in the movement do not themselves see whither the undercurrent is tending. Its professions are mild and apparently Christian. But when it shall speak, it will reveal the spirit of the dragon. The dragon was uh, wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have uh, the testimony of Jesus Christ. Is the Sunday movement making its way in darkness? Yes. Is Jesus about to come as a thief? Am I ready? Are you ready? Then inspiration says, it's time for aggressive evangelism. In the same context, blue words, she says, let's read. We should what? We should bring before the world the real question at issue, thus interposing the most effectual protest against measures to restrict what? Liberty of conscience. Is Jesus about to come as a thief? Let's turn our Bibles. First Thessalonians chapter 5. Where are we going to, my friends? Let's make sure nobody's lost. What does it mean that Christ will come as a thief? Christ will come as a thief. Talk to me. Okay, thank you, preacher. Thank you. Amen. What does it mean that Christ will come as a thief? Call our names in the judgment and declare what? A verdict upon our cases. Question, must a good man know when the thief is coming? Who is the good man? The church. So what are the signs will Christ give us? He's about to come as a thief. Not only the Sunday law, because that is outside the church. Are there any signs inside the church? When we see those signs, we know Jesus is about to come as a thief. A falling away first. Let's take a look at this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Father in heaven, give us more inspiration, we pray in Christ's name. Chapter 5, are we there, my friends? Look at verse number 1 with me. You know, friends, I saw the whole world mourning for Prince. Oh, Prince. Oh, Prince. Did Prince know what deity would die? No. no, friends. Did not know. Do I know? Do you know? Am I ready? Are you ready? Is there any repentance in the grave? No, friends. Must we be found watching, keeping our garments? Or do you treat this as just some fairy tale? No, the mere fact you're here, you don't believe that. Amen? The mere fact you're online, safe to serve, international, you don't believe that. You believe this is truth, would you say amen? Chapter 5, verse 1. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when, how will we know that Jesus will come as a thief? 
What does verse 3 say? For when they, the pronoun they, for when they shall say what? Peace and safety. Then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. So how will we know when Christ comes as a thief to declare a verdict upon my case, upon your case? What is that sign? They, who are the they? We don't know yet. Don't, do not put words inside it that's not there. Who are the they that will be crying peace and safety when Jesus is about to come as a thief? Who are the they? How do you know it's a, who? The church? Does that word say church? So how do you know? Must I guess? Should you guess? So what is the principle to discover Bible truth? We must compare scripture with scripture. So hold your place now. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, let's go in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 24. Where are we going to? Matthew 24. Let's make sure now we find the connecting links. In Matthew chapter 24, we see the same theme as Jesus coming as a thief. And a certain individual who represents groups of people in the last days will not be found ready. Matthew 24, I'll be there. Skip on down to verse 4 to 3. It says this, but no, are we together? Verse 4 to 3, but know this, that if whom again, friends? Ah, if the good men of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. He would not suffer his children to be lost. You need to listen to God's spirit today, friends. When Jesus comes as a thief, well, let me tell you what I see here. He's going to call my name because I profess Christianity. He's going to call my wife's name. He's going to call my son's name. He's going to call my daughter's name. He will call my mother's name, my father's name. He will call every single person in my family. So now, if I profess to be a good man, I must know when he's close to do this and get myself ready. Get my wife ready, meaning giving her opportunities. Get my children ready. Get my parents ready. Get the church ready. He would not suffer his house to be broken up. Friends, if, if a literal thief comes into my house, God forbid, and takes, well, don't take my Bible. But take what now? What can you take? There's nothing inside there. <laughs> Just take the paint off the wall. That's all right. But as long as my life is pure, amen, that's the most important thing. So Christ is not talking about furniture. No, souls in the house. Let's see it now. Who are crying peace and safety? Go to verse 48. It says, but and if, that who friends? Evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming and shall begin. If he says God is not coming back for now, what is he crying? I have time. I have time. He says, and shall begin to smite his fellow servant and to eat and drink with whom the drunken. Pause right there. Who does this evil servant represent? Does the evil servant represent those in the world? No. He says, my Lord delays. He's coming. It represents the church in the last days. God's professed people. And what do they do? Verse number 49. And shall begin to smite his fellow servants, to eat and drink with the drunken. So what is he doing? Talk to me. Give me in your own words. What is he doing? What will professed Christ Christians be doing right now? Backsliding. What else? Why would they backslide? I like that. 
Because they say, there's no urgency. We have much more time. Why be serious? Why come back to Bible class? Why attend prayer meeting? Why fast? Why pray? We have more time. Why study prophecy? We have more time. But it doesn't only impact him or her. What do, what do they do? They begin to force people to eat and drink with the drunken. Wait a minute. In the spiritual sense, who does the Bible call drunk? Those in the world. Babylon. So this evil servant represents professed Seventh-day Adventists. Who says, Christ is not coming back for now. We have more time. We can eat and we can enjoy the world. You can unite with Babylon and what's going on in our churches now. In our popular churches, within Seventh-day Adventism, the pastors are inviting the singers from Babylon to come and sing for us. The preachers from Babylon, they are drunk with wine. So if they come over and sing and preach to us, what are we drinking in? It's not good wine either, meaning grape juice. The true doctrines. <laughs> Look at this. Verse number 50. And the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looks not for him, in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder and appoint him what? His portion with the hypocrites. There shall be what? Weeping and uh, gnashing of teeth. Listen to this carefully. Desire of ages, 635. The evil servant says in his heart, what my friends? My Lord delays his coming. He does not say that Christ would not come. He does not scoff at the idea of his second coming. But in his heart and by his actions and words, he declares that the Lord's coming is delayed. Pause right there. So my friends, let me ask you a question. Listen to me. If you sit a child in front of uh, the same movie, the same cartoon, the same reality TV show, what will that child do after a few days of watching the same thing on the television or on the internet? What will they begin to do? Talk about it. Imitate it. So we can tell if we believe that the second coming of Christ is near. How? We're going to be, we'll be talking much about it. So when a pastor or a church member say, you talk too much of the mark of the beat, they are the evil servant. You're not hearing me. When they say too much prophecy, they are the evil servants. Let me ask you a question. If you are planning to go to somewhere very, very important, would you watch the clock? Yes. Why? And if it's very, very important, let's say it's a train you must catch. And this train only runs once a day, once a month, <laughs> once a year. <laughs> what would you do? Do you see it, friends? And we'll be talking about it. I got to get ready to get on board this train. And this train is not going to perdition. Praise God. It's going to heaven. Listen, it says the evil servant, he banishes from the minds of others the conviction that the Lord is coming quickly. I want to ask you a question, friends. Is it right here? You want me to run over this. You're watching your clock, I got to go. If you have to go, you may slip out. You're excused. How can one banish from the minds of others the conviction that Christ's coming is quick? Let me ask this question. What's, what signs does God give us to show his coming is even at the doors? Prophetic signs, current events. That means the evil servant will say, stop watching current events. Because it's the current events 
that show us prophecies being fulfilled that show us Jesus is coming as a thief. His second coming is even at the doors. May I show you one evil servant? I'm not saying he's lost. But if he doesn't change, he and others will be lost. He's a pastor. But for him to come on our page, our Facebook page, and be calling safe to serve an offshoot, as a pastor, I must say something. This is, let's pass this. This is, my friends, Samuel Dade, the pastor of Patmos Church here in Orlando. He says, when we showed how the conference, SDA conference, going forward, how the SDA conference churches are now planning to change the Seventh-day Adventist logo from this logo on the left to the one on the right, and God didn't give that to us, he gave this to us. On the, not that, but this on the wall. The three angels as our logo. So when we spoke about this, he says, you guys talk too much about the logo. Nothing is wrong with our logo. Our present logo as a denomination. Does that make sense to you, friends? Did God give us that? From the Babylonian churches? He said this. Some of you are so desperate to see, believe, and declare signs in everything. He says, what safe to serve has become, it's on our side, what this site has become is a clearinghouse of spiritual gossip and sensational speculation. Then he says, at the end of the day, the SDA church is God's church, and he doesn't need us to preach against sins in the church. Let me read that. He says, it's God's church and God alone is in charge of it and responsible for it. He has not asked any of or his words. God has not asked any to police his church or critique it. So what would you say about Elijah, Jeremiah, Moses, John the Baptist, Jesus? He says... That is the work of the Holy Spirit. And many of you should stop trying to do his job. My prayer is that you, Andrew and Weekes, allow Jesus to balance your spirituality. Then he says, discern the difference between the prophetic and the pathetic. Too much prophecy leads to you becoming pathetic. I prayed for him, friends. Too much prophecy. The evil servant eats and drinks with the drunken, unites with the world in pleasure seeking. He smiles, he smites his fellow servants, accusing and condemning those who are what? Faithful to their master. Don't talk about prophecy. You see too much prophecy in everything. <laughs> My Lord, friends. Now, I have nothing against him, but you know which group he's in, if he doesn't change. Let's move on. Even, even in our churches, people are saying, we do not want to hear any more about last generation theology. We do not want to hear about perfection. The one project movement say, if you keep on talking about prophecy, you become crazy. That's in our church. It says this. While they, let's read. While they what? While they cry, peace and safety, sudden destruction is coming. When the scorner, the rejecter of truth, has become presumptuous. When the routine of work in the various money-making lines is carried on without regard to principle, when the student is eagerly seeking knowledge of everything but his Bible. Christ comes as a thief. What does it mean for Christ to come as a thief? He examines and declares a verdict. Either you're righteous or filthy. What the students 
are so busy with schoolwork and not focusing on character building. Jesus comes as a thief to them. While parents and young adults are so focused on money making. It's right there, friends. I must work. I got to work. And you spend no time on your spiritual lives. Jesus comes as a thief. But if your pastor says, you have more time, you won't have any urgency because you have more time. I must examine myself on these points. You must examine yourself on these points. And some of us are even breaking God's Sabbath just to make money. Friends, man shall not live by but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. If you can't stand now, you won't stand then. Go back with me. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. So friend, it's a sign in the church and in the world that Christ is about to come as a thief. Some of you are troubled now. Praise God you're troubled. So much about careers and money making. Schoolwork and your spiritual lives are being placed on the back burner, as they would say. While you are focused on the world and money making and careers, to them, Jesus comes as a thief. I'm emphasizing it, friend. It's a reality. Because there is no salvation in the grave. You cannot appeal Christ's verdict cannot friends because all of heaven will be united on that verdict I see my need to get ready friends it's time to watch it's time to keep on the garment what do you say let's read the preparation here chapter 5 are we there first Thessalonians chapter 5 we read verse 1 we read through verse 3 look at verse 4 it says but you, brethren, are not in darkness. Let me pause right here. Because some folks will go over into the deep end. Pastor, you say I shouldn't work, right? Because Christ is coming, I should not work. Did I say that? No. no. <laughs> you must do your part. But make sure you know where the boundaries are. And some of us, let me just say this right here. We spend so much time in working that we don't even have time for personal devotion. We have no time for family worship with our family members. No time for self-examination, spiritual rejuvenation. So while you're focused on money-making, to you, Jesus comes as a thief. Do you see it now, friends? So much time in schoolwork. I was once there, friend. And I remember looking out the window my first semester at Oakwood, looking out my, out my window on campus, watching them walk by to class. I said, Lord, I would rather miss class this morning than miss my devotion. Amen. And God helped me through. Praise God. Amen. Yes, friend. So busy with these things and not spending time with our character. Father in heaven, awaken our minds, we pray in Christ's name. Verse number four. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all the what? The children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. So who will be ready when Christ comes as a thief? Verse 5, who are they? They're called what? They're called the children of the light. Are we studying God's word today? Then, question, what does it mean to be a child of the light? Who does the light represent? Right on John chapter 8, verse 12. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. John chapter 8 and verse number 12. So if we are going to be ready, 
when Jesus calls our name in that judgment and declare a verdict on our cases, we must be a child of Jesus, not just by profession, but by character. What else does the Bible call the light? Talk to me. Prophecy, the elder said. What text say that, preacher? Come on, Sanchez. What text say that? He smiled with me. Second Peter chapter 1. Go there with me. Let's read this one. Where are we going to? Hold your place in 1 Thessalonians. Go to 2 Peter. Friend, we must study our Bibles. Do you know how I, my heart pains me when I see people? They profess to be Christian, but they don't study their Bibles. Where are we going to? 2 Peter chapter 1. Look at verse 19. It says, are we there? Let's read verse 19. What it says, we have also a more sure word, a prophecy, whereunto you do well, that you take heed as unto a light that shines into a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in our hearts. So what does the Bible liken unto the light? Prophecy that shines here into a dark place. Until what? Jesus arise in our hearts. So those who are saying too much prophecy, they are not children of the but children of darkness, my friends. Close second, Peter. Let me give you one more. Let me hasten on. Go to Proverbs. Well, let me ask you. What else does the Bible like us unto the light? The law. The law my okay, what text say that now? Amen. Go there with me. Proverbs chapter 6. Where are we going to, friends? We must be children of the light. Converted to Christ. Studying prophecies. Obeying God's Ten Commandments. Today, what's today's date? April, chap, April 30, 2016. Today I recommit my life to God. Will you, my friends? Dear God, today I surrender anew to you. So I can be a child of the light. Is that your testimony also, friends? Jesus, I make up in my mind to study more of Bible prophecy. What do you say? Yes, dear God, give me strength to obey your commandments. What do you say? Proverbs chapter 6. Are we there, my friends? Look at verse 23. What it says here. It says, for the commandment is a what? Lamp. And the law is a light. Go back with me. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Where are we going to, my friends? It says, Jesus is coming as a thief. It's present truth. Christ is about to declare verdicts upon our cases. Am I ready? Are you ready, my brother? Look with me what we must do. Verse number six. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us what? Watch, there's a word again, and be what? Sober. Now, what things make us drunk? Because if we're not sober, when Christ calls our names, we are going to be lost. What makes us drunk, my friends? Yeah, we know false doctrines. What else? Literal wine. The drinking of coffee. Coffee and liquor are in the same category as stimulants. Only on different levels and degrees, my friends. Do your research. All right. Is that clear, my friends? And teas also with caffeine. Leave these things alone. They benumb your senses. Yes, my friends. What about overeating? Oh, beloved. And you said, don't talk about that. The Bible says we must be what? Sober. Have you ever overeaten until you feel like you just want to sleep? I've seen people eat so much they couldn't even walk. Skip on down to verse 7. For they that sleep, Sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. Verse 8, let's read. But let us who are of the day be what? Sober, putting on. Wait a minute. Putting on. Putting on what? Let's read. Putting on the breastplate of faith 
and love and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. So what must we put on? What? I heard it. The armor of God. And what is the context here? Christ coming as a thief. So now, in this scripture, Christ is coming as a what thief? What must he put on? The whole armor. That means, in chapter 16 of Revelation, verse number 15, when Christ comes as a thief, put on your garments. What is the garment then? Praise God. The garment is the armor. Go back there with me. Chapter 16 of the Revelation. And what are the parts of the armor, friends? What is it, my friend? Okay, where do we find the armor? Which, which scripture? Chapter 6 of the Ephesians. We must put it on and keep it on. Verse 15. It says in chapter 16 of the Revelation, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth, friends, listen carefully now, and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his uh, shame. I want to ask you a question. Which scripture does this verse bring you back to? It says, uh, watch, keep your garments, or else you will become naked. Where does this scripture bring you back to? You got to think. When you come to save the you got to think. Amen. The Garden of Eden. What happened to Adam and Eve? God is teaching us something here. What happened to Adam and Eve? They lost their garments and they were naked, so ashamed, they hid themselves. Wait a minute. So then, who were they to watch out for? So as not to lose their garment and become naked. Who, did, who were they to watch out for? Watch out for the devil coming to tempt. So who must we watch out for, friends? What must we watch out for? We must watch out for the temptations of Satan. Question now. Were Adam and Eve made naked? Why? What? Now, what did they do to lose their garments? To become naked. They disobeyed God's commandment. Question no, friends. So what must we do to keep the garment? Is that clear to you, friends? We don't have to guess. That means we must obey God's commandments to keep on the garment. Is Jesus coming as a thief? So must we obey the commandments of God to keep on the garment? What does a garment represent? The armor, the righteousness of Christ. But friends, we can't keep what we don't have. Somebody asked you a question now. If you were doing evangelism, if you're in Walmart, in your community, and somebody asks you, what must I do to get Christ's righteousness? What, what would you say? Don't look at me straight because we are all called to be missionaries for God. You see, friends, if you're going to a church and you aren't learning anything, I would stop. If you had your children going to a particular school and they weren't learning, learning anything, you would, you would pull them out, would you not? So what would you say if someone asked you? How can I receive Christ's righteousness? What would you say? Obey. You see what happens right there, friends? What does 1 John 1 verse 9 say? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin. And what? And to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So how then would Christ declare us if we confess our sins? Righteous. What's that garment? It's the righteousness of Christ. Confession. But after we confess our sins, how can we keep on the garment of righteousness? Obeying his ten commandments. 
One comes first, friends. It's surrendering. And as you surrender, do you see it? He then declares you righteous. Do you see it, friends? And then you keep on listening to his voice, studying his words, obeying his commandments by his strength. This is how you keep on the garment of his righteousness. So when Christ calls my name, when he calls your name in the judgment, to now declare a verdict on my case, on your case, he will then declare us righteous and righteous still. This is present truth. I see my need for the righteousness of Christ. Do you see your need, my friends? Do you see your need? Do you want to walk naked? And we know we're living in the last days when Satan is causing the world to dress nakedly. Look at those uh, antiquated pictures in past times. Women clothe their limbs, even in the world. But look how the people are dressing in the world nowadays, friends. They're naked and not ashamed about it. They're naked and they flaunt it. But you say, yes, that's true in the world. But what about the church? Women coming to church in what they call skirts. Look like my jacket. That's all. You know what I'm talking about, friends. And these men wear this tight-fitted clothing and hipster pants. What's going on in the church, my friends? Nakedness. Now, if you're coming for the first time, you come as you are in your best attire. But when you come, you can't stay that way, friends. There has to be a change. Keep on the garment, he says. Cover up yourselves, woman and men. Jesus is about to declare a verdict. And even Adam and Eve, when they were naked, did not feel right to stand before God. They hid themselves. But people come into church that way and feel no shame. It says something about the individuals, the elders in the church, the mothers in Zion, and the pastors in the pulpits. And most of those men's, men are perverts. They like it, my friends. So they say nothing. Jesus is about to come. Let's close. You know, friends, this scripture says right here in verse number, verse number 15 of chapter 16. What's the first sentence in that verse? Now, I'm closing right here. And when I'm closing, friends, it's just as important as my opening. G God is not playing games with us, friends. When Aaron went in to get that verdict on the Day of Atonement, nobody was outside playing basketball. Nobody was outside talking about, let's go to the movies. Go to what? Go to where? All of Israel surrounded the sanctuary. With deep solemnity, deep heart searching. And friends, Christ began that true work in 1844. We are at the ending of that work. Where is the solemnity, the deep heart searching? Where is it? The affliction of soul. Where is the cry, dear God? I surrender. Give me your righteousness. Where is that cry? It's lost upon this generation. So let me close. Verse 15 says what? What's the first sentence there? Behold, I come as a what? Thief. You know, friends, we have covered for the past one hour and a few minutes one perspective. Let's take a look at this at another perspective. In closing, behold, I come as a what? Do you know as I looked at this what I saw? Was Jesus ever declared and treated as a thief? Yes. Oh, my Lord. 
Go to Matthew 26 with me. Where are we going to? Just mark these verses. Matthew 26, verse number 47 through verse number 56. Matthew 26, 47 through 56. Jesus says, Behold, I come as a thief. What does behold mean? It means to look. Was Christ ever treated as a thief? Yes, he was. Look at this carefully. Let me give you one verse and then we talk and then we close. It says right here, Matthew 26. Skip on down with me to verse 55. In that same hour said whom? Jesus to whom? The multitudes are you come out as against a what? A thief with swords and staves to take me. Skip on over, Matthew 27, verse number 38. Then were there two thieves crucified with Jesus. Behold, I come as a thief. Behold, they brought me, carried me. They treated me as a thief. And we are told we must focus on the closing scenes of Christ's earth and ministry. It will convert us, my friends. Now, who brought the multitudes with staves and sticks and ropes and chains to capture and treat Christ as a thief? Who brought them? Judas. Behold, I come as a thief then my friends, we must put ourselves in this scene. Am I a Judas? Lord have mercy. Are you a Judas? My Lord, my Lord, have mercy upon us. Behold the scene, he's saying, when I was treated as a thief. Behold that scene. Am I a Judas? And what did Christ do for Judas? And because Christ knew he would be lost. He was the son of perdition in the secondary sense. How much time did Christ spend with Judas? More time. Was a verdict pronounced on his case? What thou doest? Too quickly. And when he walked out, the Bible says it was night. Night, am I a Judas? And just before Judas betrayed Jesus and treated Christ as a thief, Jesus physically and literally fed him. Am I a Judas? What's the application? I have come to church today and Jesus fed me. But when I leave, how am I going to act? How am I going to live? I must stop playing with my salvation. You must stop playing with your salvation. Probation can close, my friends. It's a reality. Behold that scene. Are you a Judas? Judas loved money more than Jesus. Lord have mercy. Love, position, career, more than Jesus. He came over and he kissed Jesus and stabbed him in the back. Figuratively speaking. Judas. Oh, my friends. Lord, I love you. And yet we sin and crucify him afresh. No different, friends. Judas. Behold, I come as a thief. Behold the scene when they treated me as a thief. Now, who drew his sword? <laughs> who drew his sword? Peter, in the time of crisis, drew his sword. What was he doing, friends? Come on. Who is a Peter today? We must know when to defend ourselves and when to give it to the Lord. Yes. You see, friends? And put yourself in the place of Judas. If somebody had betrayed you, how would you have responded? What was Christ's response to Judas? Friend, 
friend. Oh, my friends, Jesus is about to call my name in the judgment. How do I think about those who betray me, persecute me? How do I respond to them? Jesus is about to call my name. Call your name. Do you still love those who persecute you? Friend, betrays thou me with a kiss. As if to say, me, out of all the persons, me, Judas, me, Judas, and love was still in the heart of Jesus. Even though Christ knew Judas' probation was closed over for him. But was he still living? Was he still living? Dear God, search our hearts today, dear God. Am I a Judas? Am I a Christian? Am I a Christian? How do I respond when someone says this or that about me? Friends, you're black balls. Don't even touch them. Let's move on, friends. Are you a Judas? And then Christ says, watch carefully. Then Christ says, can I not call to my father? And he send 12 legions of angels to defend me. Friends, there is a time to, if someone breaks into your home, you defend yourself, my friends. But in this crisis, you give it to Jesus. When people verbally accuse you, abuse you, give it to Jesus. Why? That might be the very moment Christ says, let me call your name right now. How shall I stand in that great day? How shall you stand in that great day? Shall we be found wanting or with all of our sins all washed away? A thief, and God showed me, behold that scene when I was treated as a thief. Jesus took that for me, friends. He didn't evade it. He took it as a thief just to save me. Am I willing? to be called a criminal for Jesus? Are you willing to be betrayed for Jesus? Are you willing to be persecuted for Jesus? You know, friends, when Christ was on that cross, they put him there between two thieves. What were the last words Christ said as they called him a thief and crucified him? Forgive them. What else? His last words, what did he say? It is what? It is finished. Look at this. Quickly, go with me. Chapter 16. Go there. Behold, I come as a one. Thief. Literally, on the cross, Christ placed there as a thief. His last words were, it is uh, finished. What will Christ say? Chapter 16, verse number 15 says what? Behold, I come as a one. Thief. What does verse 17 say now? The last phrase in verse 17. It is done, my friends. It is done. Both context. Behold, I come as a thief. It is finished. It is done. Is Christ about to say it is done, my friends? I want my name to enter and remain in that book of life. How about you? But we have to surrender. As Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. Today I say, Lord, it is finished to sin. That's it, friends. What must you say to sin right now, friends? It is finished. It is done. Done. It's time to cut loose. The sins in our lives, my friends, it's time. The thoughts, the words, the actions, this is real. There's no coming back from that verdict. He comes as a thief. What do I do in secret? What do you do in secret? It is done, the very last words. It is finished, the very last words. As I look at Calvary, I hear it is finished. And when I say today it's finished, he accepts me 
All right? If you say today's finished, now I give you power now to live above sin. I want it. Do you want it, friends? And then we can say, he is able. He is able, my friends. He is able to keep us from falling. And he will finish the work in us. Amen. How do you feel right now, friends? Do you see a need to surrender all to Jesus? Do you see your need? Are you a Judas? Do you see your need? Are you a Christian? Do you see your need? Do you know what time your name will be called? Do you know? But will your name be called? Is your name being called right now? It is. But what's next? A verdict. Do you know when that verdict will come to your name? Do you know? Then, friends, common sense. What must you now do then? Surrender, friends. Will he keep us? Will he keep us? Will Christ keep us? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Father in heaven, let's kneel, friends. Let's kneel. Even those online, safe to serve, let's all kneel. Let's all kneel. Solemn time, friends, we're living in. Solemn time. Solemn time. Father in heaven, the judgment has set. The books have been opened. How shall we stand in that great day? Shall we be found wanting or with all of our sins all washed away? We want to be found in the latter group with all of our sins washed away. But for our sins to be washed away, we must surrender all to you.